This training module is designed to promote an understanding of unconscious bias and how it can affect the peer review process. It has been adapted from the Bias in Peer Review training module developed by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. If, after taking this module, you're interested in taking the longer CIHR training, please click on the above link. The objectives of the module are to provide you with an understanding of what unconscious bias is, how it can impact the peer review process, and methods that you can use to mitigate the influence of unconscious bias. Biases are shortcuts our brains form based on our culture, our experiences, things people tell us, institutional influences, and other external influences such as social media. When faced with situations or people, we use mental maps and patterns to classify them by making a number of automatic associations. Not surprisingly, our perceptions and assumptions based on these automatic associations are not always correct. Unconscious biases tend to be ingrained and it takes work to break them down. However, this can be done through active reflection and inclusive behavior. Doing this will not only benefit us, but also the people around us, the peer review process, and ultimately contribute to research excellence. Explicit bias is a result of conscious thought and can be deliberately regulated. People are more motivated to control their biases if there are social norms in place that dictate prejudice is not socially acceptable. Every peer reviewer is asked to sign a conflict of interest agreement which states that a conflict exists if a reviewer feels that for any reason he or she is unable to provide an impartial review of the document in question. Explicit bias is an example of being unable to provide an impartial review and is therefore a conflict of interest. For this reason, explicit bias will not be addressed during this training module. An unconscious bias is an implicit attitude, stereotype, motivation or assumption that can occur without an individual's knowledge, control or intention. Unconscious bias is a result of our life's experiences and affects all types of people. Examples of unconscious bias include gender bias, cultural bias, age bias, language bias, and institutional bias. Unconscious biases are important to recognize in instances when quality, relevance, and competence are being evaluated. Examples of these instances include peer review of grants and manuscripts, search committees, and reference letters. Unconscious bias affects our judgment without us realizing. For example, just by looking at them, these tables appear to be different sizes. However, in reality, they are the same size. A computer simulation was used to study the effects of a 1% bias towards the color blue over the color orange. Over eight rounds of bias, this resulted in a drastic change in the representation of each color with the representation of orange being reduced by 18%. The goal of granting agencies is to fund excellent research and researchers, but what if the indicators of excellence used to evaluate candidates are biased? Many reviewers may assume that they are applying an objective standard of excellence when they look at three traditional metrics, years of experience, number of publications and citations, and size of a candidate's research grants. However, it has been shown that all three of these metrics are subject to unconscious bias. Research has shown that underrepresented groups such as women are more likely to face systemic barriers such as more expectations to sit on committees that limit their lab time, result in less research funding, and contend with the view that their publications are less significant. In addition, women face less integration into the scientific community, such as holding positions and memberships in scientific associations and on the editorial boards of journals, 
that have resulted in them publishing 20% fewer publications than men in the natural sciences, despite being equally qualified. This bias has extended to the peer review process, where female first authors request female reviewers 21% of the time, while men request women just 15% of the time. In addition, men cite their own papers at a 35% higher rate than women. On aggregate, women self-promote their own work at a lower level and their publications receive lower recognition than the scientific community, despite being published in journals with higher impact factors. Unconscious bias is also a key factor when evaluating the productivity of researchers with career leaves and slowdowns. Members of underrepresented populations are more likely to face career interruptions because of parental, family, or medical reasons. This can understandably have an effect on the productivity of the researcher. Just because two equally qualified candidates may not have the same number of publications does not make the candidate with a career leave any less excellent. Therefore, relying on publications as an indicator of excellence without taking into consideration the impact of the leave on productivity unduly disadvantages researchers with career leaves. A recent study found that after a parental leave, male economists had a 19% point rise in the probability of tenure in their first job. In contrast, the chances of women gaining tenure fell by 22%. This is because men are more able to take advantage of this leave to publish in top tier journals. Therefore, not taking gender into account has the consequence of raising the bar for tenure even further for women. Despite this, there are many studies that show greater diversity leads to better research. In other words, the research enterprise will not reach its full potential for excellence unless it is diverse. This underscores the need to use unbiased indicators of excellence in the peer review process. There are many types of unconscious bias that affect our daily lives, and this is no different to the peer review process. However, there are different types of unconscious bias that are more likely to appear in peer review. These include gender bias, institutional bias, age bias, culture bias, and language bias. Bias can be influenced by the characteristics of both the reviewer and the applicant, as well as the nature of the application and where the research is being conducted and by whom. It is important to note that bias may not only be towards someone with different characteristics than you, but also towards someone with the same characteristics as you. For example, female reviewers can be just as unconsciously biased against female applicants as male reviewers. Unconscious gender bias has been defined as a differential treatment of men and women, the impact of which can be positive, negative, or neutral. In a 2003 study, academic linguists reviewed 312 letters of recommendation for faculty hired at a major medical school in the United States. Letters written for the female applicants were shorter and less focused on the candidate's record of accomplishment. Instead, they use more gendered terms such as intelligent young lady or insightful young woman. The letters for the women candidates also included more grindstone adjectives such as hardworking, conscientious, dependable, careful, and meticulous. In contrast, the letters for the male applicants included more standout adjectives such as excellent, superb, outstanding, or unique. This finding suggests that, that women's success is more often associated with effort, while men's success is associated with ability. The letters written for the female applicants also included more doubt raises, such as she worked hard on the project that she accepted, and were significantly more likely to have references to the applicant's personal life than those written for men. In contrast, the letters written for the male applicants were more likely to have references to their CVs, publications, or patents. It is therefore important to evaluate each candidate's entire application and not rely too heavily on only one element. Institutional bias is another common bias in peer review and is a bias that occurs due to the reputation, size, type, 
location, or prior research conducted by an institution. In addition, prestige bias and affiliation bias can also influence institutional bias, either due to the status of the institution or due to a reviewer's current or previous affiliation with the institution. Examples of institutional bias and peer review include the availability of resources, the size of the institution, and collaboration with other institutions. In terms of language bias, reviewers' assessments may be impacted by the impression of what constitutes well-written applications if the quality of the writing does not meet their expectations. In the next few slides, we'll address strategies that can be used to mitigate bias. The following steps are evidence-based behavioral strategies that can be practiced while reading an application to mitigate bias in the peer review process. Stereotype replacement. Think about a stereotype that you hold and consciously replace it with accurate information. Positive counter stereotype imaging. Picture someone who counterfills a traditionally stereotyped role. Perspective taking. Take the perspective of someone in a stereotyped group. Individuation. Gather specific information about an applicant to prevent group stereotypes from leading to potentially inaccurate assumptions. Here are some additional tools for minimizing the influence of bias and assumptions. Spend sufficient time evaluating each applicant. Studies have shown that evaluators who were busy or distracted by other tasks gave women lower scores than men for the same written evaluation of job performance. Apply the criteria consistently to all applicants. Research shows that different standards may be used to evaluate applicants of different genders. Evaluate each applicant's entire application. Don't rely too heavily on only one element of the application to evaluate an applicant. Recall the linguistic analysis that revealed unconscious gender bias. Periodically evaluate your judgments and consider whether evaluation biases are influencing your decisions. Ask yourself questions such as, are underrepresented candidates subject to different expectations or standards in order to be considered as qualified as the majority? Is research from smaller institutions or minority groups being undervalued? Have accomplishments, ideas, or findings of underrepresented candidates been unfairly attributed to research directors or collaborators, despite evidence to the contrary? You have now completed the bias and peer review training module. By completing this module, you should be able to understand what unconscious bias is, how it can impact the peer review process, and integrate methods for mitigating the influence of unconscious bias in peer review. However, being aware of unconscious bias is only the first step to mitigating these sources of bias. By learning about unconscious bias and using the additional online training resources provided in the next slides, you can review applications in a manner that is more conscious, fair, avoids unequal outcomes, and ultimately will lead to an improved review process and greater parity in grant and award distribution.